Our next speaker is Professor Rob McLean. Rob uh, has a long and illustrious background. He, um, I originally came to know Rob when he was Dean of the AGSM. Uh, he's the best Dean I've ever had. Uh, in, in before that, Rob headed up McKinsey Australia. He's currently on the board of directors of the Ramsey Foundation uh, and the chairman of the National Conservancy Trust. Nature Conservancy. Nature Conservancy. But very importantly for us here at DARE, Rob is chairman of our advisory board, so it is with great pleasure that I welcome Rob McLean to talk about how business is navigating COVID-19 uncertainty. Uh, thank you, Sally, for the uh, for the introduction. And uh, one of the great pleasures I have in my various roles is to reaching out to Sally and her, her team for the kind of innovative solutions that we've been hearing um, already this afternoon. Um, I'm going to take a a, a different tack than what you've been uh, hearing so far and talk about how business is navigating the uncertainty of COVID-19. I'm going to provide a perspective from private equity. Uh, no maths, no models in this, uh, this particular session. But as I look at this last uh, few months, um, what I've been struck by is there's an extraordinary amount of agility that's going on in businesses and a lot of what I call leaning into trends like online versus face-to-face, -face, digital payments and moving to the cloud. Um, there's no hibernation uh, that I see of businesses in, um, in this particular environment. If we just take a few examples, one ed tech uh, venture I'm uh, aware of just done a remarkable pivot from uh, providing their solutions in school to remote learning and attracting literally tens of thousands of people from around the world uh, with a six week free trial. So they've ended up with an international strategy um, during this period of time. Another company in business process outsourcing has shifted 5,000 staff from uh, working in an office to working from home. Um, a, a retailer initially closed and now has reopened 65 stores all in the space of about eight weeks. An advertising group saw that there were going to be significant issues uh, to uh, advertising spend and then prepared for the worst by putting a significant bank overdraft facility in place. And another company I'm involved in in software has knuckled down and uh, is using pay cuts and JobKeeper to preserve the cash and live to, um, live to fight another day. So they're the kind of things that are going on, but if I, if I try to um, abstract and go from the particular to the general, I want to make uh, a couple of observations and share with you today. And um, my overall argument is that businesses have become Bayesians with an epistemic humility. They may not realize that, but I'll, I'll tell you why I've come to that point of view. The, um, the first point is that the level of uncertainty is subsiding, but remains uh, high. Uh, there's elements of uh, what we've been talking about of a Bayesian approach that with an epistemic humility that's called for. And I want to just describe the kind of adaptive actions that I see happening in, uh, in the companies that, um, that I'm involved in that are consistent with high levels of uncertainty. When I think about uncertainty, um, my training was in, um, in finance, and so I immediately think about measure of, un of uncertainty that relate to finance. And one of the best measures around is what's called the VIX volatility index. And that's, that's a measure uh, that is the square root of the variance um, of 30 day futures on the um, uh, CBOE uh, normalized to 100. And you can see, you can see that uh, what we've just gone through has approximated uh, what something similar to the GFC in 2009 and a, a far greater level of volatility uh, and uncertainty than we've seen in, in 30 odd years. When you look uh, at what's happened this year, uh, you can see that that uncertainty has fallen quite uh, dramatically. Uh, but note that where we are right now, we're still about double the levels um, of uncertainty than pre-COVID-19. Uh, COVID now I'll come back to this a little bit later, so you would ought to expect that businesses aren't rushing to take big bets in this uh, in this type of uh, environment when the uncertainty prevails. Now, this is not the only measure of um, of uncertainty. And one that we uh, we talked about in uh, our book uh, uh, Bulletproof Problem Solving, we laid laid out five levels of uncertainty uh, that range from what are sometimes called known unknowns where things are reasonably predictable. And if you want to forecast, you know, global sales of mobile phones, you know, you'll come within a couple of percent of that number reasonably easily. 
On the other hand, when you get to the famous unknown unknowns of truly unexpected or unforeseen conditions like a meteorite hitting Earth, um, well, you know, then you've got an extraordinary level of uncertainty. But when I think about the things that um, I've seen and been involved in, when you go through level two, level three, I put the situation we're in, you know, somewhere around um, level three and level three and a bit uh, today. It's not, I don't think it's um, true ambiguity at all, um, but it still remains, um, it remains very significant. Now, what do you do in this kind of environment? And um, I think many of us have heard of uh, what I call letter shape recovery. Some people have talked about whether it's going to be a V, which meant a sharp contraction and then a quick improvement, whether it's going to be a U, which is a protracted level of, um, of a downturn, whether it's going to be a W, where you have a, a double dip, um, or whether it's going to be a J or an inverted J. Now, the little diagram I've got here sets out if you have a predicted recovery um, to be a V-shape and it turns out the actual recovery turns out to be a V-shape, well, you're fine, you've got it right. And then similarly, if, it, if you predict a U and, um, and it turns out to be a U. But businesses don't like uh, trying to predict with, with this level of uncertainty. But what they do, and I think this will be familiar to many of the statisticians uh, on our call today, is they think about what, wh whether they face a type one or a type two um, error, whether it's going to be a false positive or a false negative. And the error magnitude depends a lot on who you are and where you are and right now, particularly whether you have large amounts of cash or not. And so to avoid getting it vastly wrong, what I do see a lot of is a lot of calculations going on to say, are we more concerned about a type one error where, you know, we, we made a whole lot of people redundant and we walked away from leases and then it turned out that it was a V-shaped recovery and everything was fine. We shouldn't have done it. Or if we hung on thinking it was going to be a V, but it's turned out to be a U or an L and we've exhausted so much of our cash, we've gone with low utilization, no profitability. Uh, for a significant period of time. So that's the, the, the kind of thinking that I see going on. In practice, I've called this uh, Bayesians with epistemic humility. And I like this, uh, this quote from Eric Angner, who's uh, a behavioral psychologist, uh, where he talks about epistemic humility being grounded in the realization that our knowledge is always provisional and incomplete, and that it might require revision in the light of new, of new evidence. Now that struck me as being very much the essence of what it is that Bayesians do um, in that you, you start with priors and you conduct uh, experiments and seek to find data uh, to do the revision uh, that, that's necessary uh, to come up with your uh, posterior, uh, posterior probability. What businesses do in practice, um, we term, we talk about strategic staircases they think quite hard about where they want to be and work backwards towards planned outcomes. But the steps that they take, like right now, they take small steps with low amounts of stretch to reflect the uncertainty. Um, you know, if things like, if we don't see examples coming out of uh, second waves, um, they build on momentum from that early success and the information uh, that they collect and take additional steps but they seek to remain flexible or somewhat fluid in the face of continuing uncertainty. What makes up this staircase is a whole lot of sequenced um, actions. And when we, we think about the adaptive action that uh, uh, organizations take to address uncertainty, when there's high levels of uncertainty as there are right now, where I'm describing is like level three, one of the best things you can do is to do nothing um, and just buy time, just see whether that uncertainty will abate uh, for a little bit. We saw quite a lot of this in that late March, early April, uh, when you know across the world uh, planned advertising camps, but campaigns by multinational companies, they just shut them down. They just put them off for quite a period of time. But we would argue that while you may not be doing anything, uh, you know, that's, that's terribly bold. There are quite a lot of things you can do to buy information you know, via experiments um, and particularly to look for where there are natural experiments. And you know, so for example, 
some of the analysts looked at what happened with Nike um, in Nike sales in the first quarter of this year in China, where they'd had the, uh, the coronavirus and worked out that um, Nike sales were only off something like 6% um, in that period of time. So that gave a lot of analysts a good degree of comfort, um, you know, that they could sort of see what was going on. And just talking to my colleagues at McKinsey, they were saying there's just a huge amount of interest right now in saying what's going on in South Korea, what's going on in Taiwan in banking, where they are a, a month or two months ahead of where we are. Um, in Australia. Now, the other things you try to do when you've got high levels of uncertainty is to see whether you can buy hedges. And hedges are offsetting opportunities. So we've seen a lot of retailers, as their stores have been closed, double down um, on online um, shopping and seen quite dramatic growth in online shopping. I gave the example before of um, edtech companies that are shifting from in-school to remote learning. One of the other wonderful things you want to try to do when you've got high levels of uncertainty is to buy insurance. But that depends on whether markets exist. And one of the great stories in this um, you know, terrible pandemic is that of Wimbledon, the Wimbledon tennis tournament. After SARS in 2003, they took out pandemic insurance. And guess what? They've received a payout of 140 million this year um, you know, for not holding the uh, for not holding the tournament, uh, but that that's an example of adaptive of adaptive strategies. You also seek to buy low cost options, and one of the the best options uh, that you can take right now, if you're a company, is to make sure that you've got adequate debt and equity to survive. And but that depends, of course, on equity and debt markets being open. They weren't open to the same degree in the great the global financial crisis, but we have seen a swathe of capital raisings um, taking advantage of, of this market and, and allowing companies uh, to be in a position where they can survive. And probably one of my favorites is to think about no regrets moves. And no regrets moves um, are, are moves that you take with high levels of uncertainty where you accelerate a commitment. And if you see something that's gonna be right, no matter whether the the recovery is V, U, L, W, J, inverted. Um, an example here is digital transformation. It, it, it yeah. makes sense uh, to step up your digital transformation. It makes sense to move to the cloud, regardless of the particular shape um, of, the, um, of the recovery. And then finally, what you don't see much of, um, but it can play an enormous role in uh, longer term success, are big bets. And big bets, um, in my uh, experience, typically come from insights on customer purchases. Amazon, in, in this second quarter, has added 175,000 new people um, in the US. Um, and that's about a 25% um, a increase in its staff. Why did it do that? And why did it um, take 70% uh, of those uh, people have hired permanent hires. So they, they've made a big bet on the um, on the future. But one of the reasons why was that their first quarter, their online sales were up 26%. So they, they already had a picture of what the world was going to be like that gave them that confidence. Now, another big bet that you would have read about in the last couple of days um, is Bain Capital's purchase um, of Virgin. Um, and, um, and that is a very, very bold um, big bet. If things turn around, it could turn out to be a fabulous, um, fabulous bet. Uh, on the other hand, if it's if it takes two years to get back to international uh, traffic and borders are closed for a long period of time, it may be harder for it to work, uh, harder to, 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 to make out. So that, they're the kind of things that I see um, of an adaptive nature that are happening um, as businesses respond uh, to uh, to the COVID uh, virus. Um, quite. Um, agile um, approaches, uh, quite measured in terms of thinking about levels of uncertainty. Um, but the only sophistication that I see uh, that comes close to the work of so many in the room um, is the, the work related to scenarios. Um, you might, might expect that you would have seen more Monte Carlo uh, type simulations, but uh, it doesn't mean they don't exist, but I haven't seen them in the companies um, I've invo I'm involved in. Um, but nevertheless, you see uh, some very systematic, thoughtful, 
um, ways of trying to come to grips with the level of uncertainty um, and, and respond um, as best people can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for that very insightful talk. Epistemic humility, I'm going to look that word up, epistemic. <laughs> and I like the fact that it's essentially about being Bayesian. Yes, it is. is. Nice. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, thank you very much.